We've covered everything from the title page to into action. We're convinced of the ABCs, and this is something I wanted to mention. The next time you're in inventory, try this. Every time you sit down to write, and every time you get up from writing, review the first three steps quietly. You can do that by when you sit down to write, you read from the ABCs up to wherever you are in inventory. And then you'll find you're much more centered because you're reminded of why you're writing inventory. What I lose sight of sometimes is that I'm writing inventory because I'm powerless over alcohol. And I get lost in that I'm writing inventory to manage my life or my emotions or my circumstance. You get in a bunch of trouble, write inventory, you're going to make it go away. You're using inventory as a self-help tool. I need to remind myself that I'm alcoholic, that my life is unmanageable, that no human power can relieve my alcoholism, and that God can and will if he is sought. I need to remind myself of the first requirement of the third step, and I mostly need to re- re- remind myself that I des- what I decided, my third step decision. That's what I go back on sometimes. I remember when I was new sitting in a meeting at the, where these, these men cared more about whether you lived or died than how you might feel about what they have to say. And I was saying something about I turned it over and I took it back. And I turned it over and I took it back. Like I got that kind of power. I don't have the power to turn it over or take it back. And this old boy said, why don't you shut up and sit down? Because if you're still thinking you can turn it over and take it back, you haven't turned it over. So then I asked the great question. How do you turn it over? Go around AA. If you, Go around AA and ask people that. And they'll say, oh, just let go. Well, how do you let go? Oh, just turn it over. <laughs> oh, shut up. Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. Because right? they don't know how to tell you how to turn it over. But this guy said, the way you turn it over is like a chicken and a pig. Because there's a difference between a decision and a commitment. There's a decision at the third step. The commitment is in four through nine. I asked the great question, what do you mean? He said, well, it's like a chicken and a pig walking down the road. And they come to a sign on a church that says, help feed the poor. And the, and the, the chicken is all pumped up with virtue. And he says to the pig, we ought to feed those poor people. The pig says, well, how could we, what could we feed those poor people? And the chicken says, ham and eggs. <laughs> the pig says, for you, that's just a simple decision to lay some eggs. But for me, that's one hell of a commitment. It took me about a week to figure out what the guy was talking about. And then I knew the way you turn it over is in four through nine. So it says here... And I know this, four through nine are directly against my will and contrary to the way I've lived my life. So that's how you turn it over. You turn your will and your life over to the care of God by realizing, one, your life run on your will doesn't work. Number two, by taking direct actions against your will and contrary to the way you've lived your life. And I'll tell you, four through nine are against my will and contrary to the way I'm living my life or I wouldn't need to be doing four through nine. It says here, having made your personal inventory, what are you going to do about it? You've been writing, you've been doing this to get a new attitude and a new relationship with your creator and to discover the obstacles in your path. You've admitted certain defects. You've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. You've put your finger on some of the weak items in stock. Now these are about to be cast out. This requires action on your part which when completed will mean that you have admitted to God, to yourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of your defects. This brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. talks about this might be difficult. talks about finding the right person. It talks about what will happen if you skip this vital step. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts. Invariably, they got drunk. Well, that's as true for newcomers as it is for old-timers. Time after time, old-timers have tried to keep to themselves 
certain facts they couldn't admit to their sponsor in their home group because they're elevated in their own mind to such a position that they couldn't admit that stuff to their sponsor or in their home group, and it kills them. Um, these sprees they talk about can be drunk or sober. Self will sprees. Talks about being entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world. Do I believe that? Now it says something I missed for many years. Rightly, in, on page 74, rightly and naturally we think well before we choose the person. It's the top three lines. We think well before we choose the person or persons <coughs> with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. And that's the line that Paul Martin's group in Chicago took, along with what Harry Tebow and this other psychiatrist shared with them, and they started doing multiple fist steps. And it's a very simple it's a very simple principle. The more you the more open you be, the more people you become open with, the more open you become. And they fist step with more than one person. So I saw my grand sponsor after I knew him for ten years, and he was twenty six years sober. And his name's Gary, Gary Brown from Indianapolis, and he was different. He was just on fire. He was different than I'd ever known him. And he'd been doing the work for a long time. And I said, Gary, what, what's going on with you? He said, well, I've had a pretty amazing experience after 26 years of sobriety. I took an inventory up to Paul. I fist-stepped with several people. And I, went, I saw some stuff with some financial amends that I wasn't clear on. I went home and I spoke to my wife, and we sold the house. They had a huge, beautiful house, and they moved into a trailer. And he he paid off some financial stuff, and he was he was on fire. And I thought, my God, the willingness of somebody with that much time to do that. So being a good alcoholic, I had to take an inventory to Paul Martin in Chicago. And I was going to see my family in Michigan. And I called Paul, and he said, come on a Thursday and stay till Sunday afternoon. So I saw my family in Battle Creek, and I drove to Chicago. I arrived on Thursday. They took me to their home group. It was a wonderful meeting. They do a step a week, and they were on the 10th step, and they took me back to the hotel, and Paul hands me a mimeograph sheet, and it said Friday, 9 o'clock Charlie, 1 o'clock Sam, 4 o'clock Harry, Saturday, 9 o'clock Frank, 1 o'clock Charlie, four o'clock, Tom, Sunday, one, nine o'clock, eleven o'clock, one o'clock, and I did nine fist steps with nine different people, the same inventory. And every time I read mine, they read theirs. And they asked for feedback, and then I asked for feedback. And I saw when I looked at this sheet of paper, I saw, man, this is going to be like a three-day retreat. And I called the front desk and I said, turn off my phone and come get the television. And I did an hour meditation before and after each fist step. So in three days, I did nine fist steps and 18 one-hour meditations. And I came out of that room changed. I read to people from, it was like one of those movies where they're interviewing babysitters. And every one of them is different. And it would go to the next one. I think halfway through Saturday, I wanted to just start screaming. And I just wanted to call somebody. And I sat through it. And I sat through it. Now, I don't do nine fist steps every time now, but since then, I've always done more than one. I know couples. The people I live with right now, Jaime and Shelley, wonderful couple, they've, re they've read their inventories together. I know couples that do the work together. They don't keep their programs separate. There's a philosophy I don't understand. I'm going to take the most important thing in my life, which is AA my relationship with God. I'm going to take the most important person in my life, the person I claim to love, and we're going to keep our program separate. I think it's fine if you have different meetings you like, but the program should be shared with your family. Meditation, even a fist step. So each time now, I've always fist step with a woman. It gives you a different perspective. This last one... I fist stepped with the guy taking me through the work, which was which is Mark Houston, because he was there in New York when I was done. We were both in New York together. I read to him. 
I read to a guy in New York I've sponsored for 14 years. I read to a woman I sponsor in New York that I'd only known for six months. She's 17 years sober that I was working on. And I fisted up with three guys in Los Angeles that I was in a group with um, where we were learning about being accountable. Six of us. I read to three of them. And uh, every one is, is, takes you a little deeper. Um, and it does come from this line. We think well before we choose the right person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. It talks about a closed mouth, understanding friend. I can't reiterate that enough. And I'll tell, I'll tell you this. Be friends with your friends, but know who your friends are. Or you'll find yourself blindsided by people that aren't. Mark, in my last inventory, Mark Houston kept saying to me, he said, you keep referring to these people as friends. And they're really not. And you find out. And then you're upset. Right? These betrayal bonds. Betrayal bonds. Going back to people that repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly betray you, expecting a different result. Right? Be friends with your friends, but know who your friends are. And don't go to someone who's not a friend. And if you hear a fist step, honor that. Let the person know you're honored with their confidence. There's as much to hearing a fist step as there is to reading your own. I like to swap fist steps now. You read me yours, I'll read you mine. It's a powerful experience. It can be just as powerful hearing one as it is reading one. I have a guy, and I never had heard this. I never had thought it. It was total intuition. We were at a retreat center in Arizona, and he had been there for a few weeks finishing an inventory, and I arrived for a week. And during that week, we were going to do his fist step, and I was reminded when we sat down, he has trouble reading. And when he's reading, he's always thinking. And he's here in his mind when he's reading, trying to figure out the next word. You know what I did that came to me out of the blue? I read his inventory to him. He heard his fist step read to him. And he said it was the most powerful fist step he ever had. And he's been doing the work for a long time. Trust your intuition. I blew someone's mind the other day with something that came to me out of the blue. It's a past relationship, someone I was engaged to. And now she's sober again, and she's on fire, and she's making amends. And she came down to L.A. from Seattle, and we spent uh, two weeks. We went to my home group every Tuesday, and my other, the other meeting I go to on Saturday. And for two weeks, we talked. I let her talk about her amends. And when she was done, she had two pages of notes, and she had two three-by-five cards. And she wanted to go through those and make sure she didn't miss anything. And we took the two pages and the, and the two uh, cards and I put them in an ashtray and I lit them on fire and we smudged with her amends cards. <laughs> it was strange, but it was very healing. We burned them and we did it like sage with her amends. It was very healing. And I never thought of that before, you know. And I think at this point that we're coming up to, which is after a fist step, and, and remember, there's a very important thing that's part of the fist step. It's not step six. It's not step four. It's part of your fist step. And that's at the bottom of page 75 when you return home. And this is that page where you haven't been, if you haven't been clear about the cement put into the foundation, on the first page of there is a solution, and you haven't been clear on the cornerstone at the, at the second step, your willingness to believe, and you haven't been clear on the keystone at the third step, your decision, think about what this paragraph would mean to you if you hadn't been thorough. Imagine if your sponsor didn't use the book, but after the fifth step, he referred you, he or she referred you to the bottom paragraph, and you returned home, and you found a place where you can be quiet. Remember, that's not just a physical place. Find a place where, within yourself where you can be quiet. I know guys that will set a timer for an hour and literally put their book up on a shelf so they can take it down from the shelf. I bet Dave does that. I just have an idea that Dave probably does that. And, and uh, my other friend says, find a place where you can be quiet. Carefully review what you have done. Look through the inventory. Now, this is confusing if you don't know what inventory is about. How can I thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know him better if all I've been doing is looking at self for ten hours? Why? Because I've seen a lot of truth in the inventory, and if I've seen truth, I've seen God. That's how I know God better, because I've seen truth. God is truth. 
That's how I thank God that I know him better. Take the book down. Turn to the page which contains the 12 steps and how it works. Read the first five proposals and ask if you've omitted anything. For you're building an arch through which you'll walk a free man at last. Is your work solid so far? Now, those questions aren't confusing, but what about the next three questions? Are the stones properly in place? What are they talking about? If you haven't been thorough. They're talking about the cornerstone at the second step. They're talking about the keystone at the third step. Are they in place? Have you skimped on the cement? How could you skimp on the cement and the foundation? That's having found a common problem but not a common solution, or just a common solution without the common problem. It's that description of the cement on page 17. Review that cement. Is my foundation strong? Have I found a fellowship where I share in the common problem? And have I found a fellowship where I share in the common solution? Or is it out of balance? Have you tried to make mortar without sand? Have you tried to create fellowship without recovery? Have you tried to get recovery without fellowship? The two parts to the cement are recovery and the common problem. Review the stones. Review what you've done. Review the first five proposals. And I believe between page 75 and the top of page 76, they make a dramatic shift. Now, how do I say that? If you think of everything that we've covered from the, from the title page to page 76, it's all kind of been, I don't want to say negative, but it's all kind of been negative about you, your mind, lack of power, selfishness, even when your motives are good, looking at your part, lack of power, lack of power, lack of power. After the fifth step and after returning home, they make a major assumption they start to go by on 76, and that is now you've got some power. Now you can begin to trust this power because the next question after 75 is, have I answered to my own satisfaction? You start to trust. Wasn't there something in there that we didn't get to read? You may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now you begin to have a spiritual experience. That's step five. Because from 76 on, they're going to start to make an assumption that you should make, that you've got some power, that you've got some faith, you've done some work, because now they're going to start to ask you some questions like you should be able to trust. When you've answered to your own satisfaction, so I encourage people to do returning home as many times and as many days as they need to until they've answered to their own satisfaction. They're asking you to start to trust yourself with God. When you've answered those questions and returning home to your own satisfaction, let's look at step six. And my mind always goes like this, because there's a lot in this paragraph that you don't see. We've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. And my mind always says, of course I'm willing. Why are they making such a big deal of willingness after all this work? Well, they're going to show you why. And they start with the first question. Are you now ready to let God remove from you all the things you have admitted are objectionable? Yes or no? Usually after a thorough fist step or a few fist steps, there is nothing I'm not willing to let go. But then they ask you another question. Can he now take them all, every one? I don't know. I know that he can, so I add to that. Whenever they ask, can he? I ask another question there. Will he? For me. With all this mud on my face that I've just admitted. Not only can he take them all. I usually don't have any doubt about that. Of course he can. But I need to think about will he for me. Then they ask, am I still clinging to anything that I'm not willing to let go? How do you know that if you don't look back through and make a list of anything you're still clinging to? So it's my, my, my advice is to go back through the inventory and look for any behavior, beliefs, defects, anything. And just write down the ones that you're not willing to let go of. And be honest. And stay in that place for a few days. Admit your unwillingness. Admit that there's a few things you're not willing to let go. 
And then you'll see why they mean by the first statement that willingness is important here. Yes, I am willing to let it all go. Some people confuse with clinging to something. And I love they use that term, clinging, because that's where all my suffering comes from, which comes from ignorance. Then I start to grasp for things. Then I get them, and then I cling to them. If I'm, if I'm still clinging to something that I'm not willing to let go, I ask God to help me be willing. A lot of people interpret that, that if they go home and write down a few things they're not willing to let go of, that it means they need to quit doing it by tomorrow. It doesn't say, are there still some things that you can stop doing by tomorrow? It says, are there still th- some things that you're clinging to that you're not willing to give to God? I write them down. I sit with my unwillingness. And then I go, yes, I am willing. And then I see what they mean by the first statement. Willingness is indispensable. When I first asked it, before I asked the other questions, it didn't seem important. But when I asked the other questions, can he, will he, am I still clinging to something? And I get honest. Yeah, there's a couple things here I'm not willing, or I'm willing. Then you see what what they mean by the first sentence. Then they ask you to assume and trust once again, because now they make another statement that you should be able to trust. When ready. Last week, because I, I guess it not last week, last month, last actually in July, because my group, one of our formats each month is a step a month. So the seventh month, we were on the seventh step. And I said, I think the greatest thing to consider with the seventh step, because there's only one paragraph, is when is ready. What do they mean when they say when ready? We say something like this. When is ready? Write that question down there. Is ready when everything's straightened out and you're feeling better? Is ready when you know you can work on all these defects you've just seen? No. So when is ready? Is it based on circumstance? You've waited for all your ducks to be in a row before you go on to step seven? No. You're waiting until your emotional state is all straightened out until you go on to step seven? No. When is ready? Ready is when there's nothing left that I still want to cling to, that I'm not willing to give to God. Then you should look at what you're going to say in the prayer before you say it, and then in your own way, however you're guided to do it, you should go somewhere and do the seven-step prayer. It's usually a very personal and a very private experience between you and God, because that's all you're down to. Why do they say the good and the bad? Because I don't know by step seven. What I thought was good is killing me. What I thought was bad is saving my life. My assets have turned into my liabilities. My liabilities have turned into my assets. So I just got to be willing to give it all. And that's what it says. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and the bad. I don't know the difference. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of my character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and to my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. And what's God's bidding after step seven? Eight. How do you know when you've completed seven? When you're sitting down with a pen and a piece of paper and you're making an eight-step list. And that's the next action. Without which we find that faith without works is dead. And I always thought that without my work, God will have no faith in me. No. Without this work, I won't have any faith in him. It's not about how he feels about me. He's been there from the beginning. No one in this room is any closer to God than anybody else in this room. Some of you in this room think you're closer to God than some other people in this room. You're not. No one in this room is any closer to God than the last time they took a drink. The only thing that changes here is our perception of something that's always there. That's the only thing that changes. His love doesn't change. His presence doesn't change. Only our perception of that which has always been there. So I go through my inventory. It says I have a list. I made it when I took inventory. I make my list. I've got people to make amends to. I've got institutions I've harmed. I've got principles to look at. How do you make amends to principles? Ah, good question. I pray and I pray. Are there any other amends I'm not aware of that belong on this list? And I keep that prayer going until I'm done with every one of them. Show me any amends I'm not aware of every day. And show me the next amends I should make. 
Some people just set out and make their own agenda for making amends. Some people set out thinking they got to have all the money before they can go back to somebody. That's just ego. It's a lot harder to go back and say, this is the best deal I can do. I can pay you five bucks a week. Agree on the best deal. I think I got to have all 25 grand to go to him. That's just ego. So you have a list and you keep praying and you keep praying. And then you begin to experience something that I would hope nobody in this room misses because it's absolutely the most incredible experience I've ever had in my life every time I've ever been in a mint. There's probably stories in this room, and I could go on until tomorrow, about amazing stories and amends that I thought could never be healed, nor that I could ever find them. Everyone probably, everyone that's ever been in amends, I know you have stories about how somebody showed up, or you had someone you never had seen in 20 years, you pull up to a stoplight and there they are next to you. I could go on and on about stories. I mean, it's, it's like the whole universe opens up for you. I've known 10, 15, 20 year spiritual Dharma students you sit with and you mention not even like you would with another alcoholic. Could that be selfish? Or might you owe an apology there? And they look at you like you're just out of your mind because they have no basis for examining themselves and they just get lost in their own world of spiritual make-believe. But we get a system here that to this day is as life-altering as anything else I've ever been exposed to along with something else we'll get to in a minute. But step nine is really where it started to happen. Step nine is where a lot of people lose the obsession that they've lived with in sobriety, that God has kept them from drinking. It starts to be removed. Some of us had the obsession removed the day we walked in or the day we took the third step or somewhere in inventory. But don't become one of these guys that thinks because you haven't thought about alcohol for a long time that you couldn't drink again. Because you might be the guy that doesn't think at all and finds himself in a bar having not even thought about it. Thinking about drinking doesn't have much to do with whether the obsession is going to come or not. The obsession is going to come from falling into an unfit spiritual condition by resting on your laurels, by not taking 10 and 11 serious, by not being concerned about working with others or practicing principles in your life. And then one day, there you are. You thought it was just unmanageability. It turned into a drink. There you are. You've come full circle back again. I had people in Denver where they do the work tell me you can't go back to someone who's dead and make amends. i got to tell you, my two most powerful amends were at the grave of my father and the grave of this man who died in my arms, who I was closer to than my father. My dad, I went to his grave in Battle Creek, Michigan, and I had had four visits to Battle Creek before I got to amends. And every visit, because Battle Creek's a small town, I was like this. looking over my shoulder wherever I went that I might run into somebody that I hurt or that was after me. And I would always visit this one guy who was in AA that I grew up with. I later became his sponsor. And we would always go to a meeting, and then we would always go to this nightclub to steal some vicarious pleasure. And I would dread going in there, but he would always want to that I might see somebody. And in four visits, maybe I saw one or two people from the past. When I got to amends and I went to Battle Creek, and I started making amends to my family. I went to a meeting one night with my friend, and we went to this nightclub. Twelve people walked in that club that I could make appointments with to see to make amends. I made those amends in my hometown, and, of course, I make the biggest one last. And just as I was going back to the airport to fly back to Denver, I went to my dad's grave, and I sat at his grave, and I talked to him about what I had done that I thought hurt him. And I'd asked him what I could do to make it right, and I sat there, and I left that grave. I left that graveyard different than I'd ever been in my life. I was guided not to go to the airport, but to take a drive from where I was born to where I grew up, to the bars and the dope houses. And I drove around that city, and there wasn't one hook. There wasn't one hook anymore. And I was no longer looking over my shoulder in the town where I grew up, and I was free. But I couldn't go to this man's grave in Las Vegas who died in my arms of drugs that I paid for. Made amends to him through a letter. Read it to my sponsor. Made amends to his mother. Made amends to his father. Made amends to his sister. 
I made amends to his brother. He put a gun at my head and said, tell me the truth about how my brother died. <laughs> got free. He got free. Second year, I couldn't go to his grave. I was three years sober, and it was my AA birthday. And I had been in Las Vegas probably seven, eight times in those three years, and I couldn't get myself to his grave. On my third AA birthday, I wake up at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, and my thought was, today you're going to his grave. It's your third AA birthday. The power's there. No resistance. Got a driver. Drove to Henderson, Nevada. Three friends were with me. I walked up to the grave like I knew right where it was. I got down on my knees. I said what I needed to say, and I looked down, and I was there on the anniversary of his death, and it was my sobriety day, just different years. I can't plan stuff like that. I ended up there on the anniversary of his death, and the anniversary of his death turned out to be my sobriety date. How do you make amends to a mother you talk to through a plate glass window on a phone in the Michigan State Penitentiary? And when she died two years ago, she and I were free and clear. She was so clear, she said to me, this will be the last time we see each other. And it was. It wasn't with drama, it was with clarity. She said goodbye to me. Ten minutes before I was leaving for the airport, I went in the bathroom. I'd been there a week. I went in the bathroom and I thought, why didn't she tell me this on Monday rather than Sunday? And I got on my knees and I said, is there anything I need to say to my mother? And the answer was, no, you're clear. And why don't you let her do it the way she wants to for once in your life? If this is the day she wants to say goodbye, ten minutes before you're leaving for the airport, let that be okay. And it was the last time I saw her. And we were clear for a long time. You can make amends to people that are dead. You can make amends to people you can't find. And you'll find most any situation you have is described in these pages. The practical instructions I was given for my eight-step list was to take each name off my eight-step list, put it on a three-by-five card, and fill out the card. Name address, phone number, or just the word find, and I know that's one I need to find, the harm that I'm clear on, and in the upper right-hand corner, plus or minus, willing or not, and stay in the eighth step till you're willing to make amends to them all. Don't miss that. My sponsor got sober in the Colorado State Penitentiary. He got to step eight. He didn't get, they didn't let him out because he was on step nine in AA. <laughs> he had to stay a few more years or a year and a half or something. He told me that he got free in the eighth step from his willingness to make amends to them all. And that getting out, it was just like a formality to go to all these people because he was already free. He got free in prison. Right? And then he went out and started making them. And about 20 years later, he was made the director of the Department of Corrections for the state he was locked up in. And you can't get there from, 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 there to, from here to there on your own power. A year and a half sober, I'm halfway through amends. I made the director of a program for the National Council on Alcoholism, training kids to work with kids, peer counseling. A year and a half earlier, you wouldn't have let me near your children. And they were trusting me to work with kids. And my own mother said I wasn't even the same. And the whole universe opened up for me. I'll tell you about two guys, because they're so different, but they're so similar. I sponsored a black guy who never left South Central L.A. for 30 years. He had never been to the beach. He'd never seen the ocean. And South Central is about 10 miles from the beach. He lived in a 20-mile radius, and he had 350 amends. 200 of them were breaking and entering. 150 were friends and family. He made amends to his friends and family and got so much power from each of those amends, he started making cold calls on neighborhoods where he knew he broke into houses. He used to pray at the top of neighborhoods, Dear God, please show me the homes I broke into. He's got stories you wouldn't believe. He's got stories about families saying, It's nice that you're here, but we need your help because our son's in trouble. Or will you get on your knees and pray with us? Or... And he got free, and he's free to this day. The other kid that was around the same time lived in many different countries in his life. And we got to amends, and he had 350, and we had to put him in piles of continent. North America, South America, England, France, and Asia. He came over to my house and with his eight-step cards done. We put him in piles of continent. 
And he said to me, you know what I'm going to do? I said, what? He said, I'm going to make all these amends and prove to you the program of Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work. Out of spite, I'm going to make these amends. He was half joking, but half not. He started in North America. He went to South America. He went back to England. He went to France. He went to Asia, where his mom and dad were. And two weeks after his last amends, his father passed away. He inherited $10 million cash and a multi-million dollar corporation that he's been running to this day successfully. And this kid could not have done that one month earlier. That's the kind of stuff that starts to happen in amends. My first fiance, when she moved back to California from Denver, I called her up from Los Angeles. I told her I had five other amends in L.A. and I hadn't even been there for years. I can cause harm long distance without even going there. And I called her up and I said, can I make amends? And she's in the program. And she said, I don't know if I even want to see you. You really hurt me. I slept with a woman that she was sponsoring when she went on vacation. Because we had a little fight on the phone. That can't be healed by me. And I call her and she says, I don't know if I can see you, but let me pray about it. Call me tomorrow. I called her the next day and she said, well, I called your sponsor. <laughs> and she called her sponsor. And they decided that, they, that she would see me on her terms and on her turf. And I should be at her mother's house at 6 o'clock the next day. Then I had another one. And I was speaking at a CA meeting that night that I never would have gone to on my own at a rib joint at 11.30 at night in, in South Central Los Angeles. And I had one more that I couldn't find. And then the one to the X the next day. And I told my story at the CA meeting. A woman walks up to me and she said, you got sober in Denver? I said, yeah. She said, did you know Cindy so-and-so? I said, yeah. She's one of my amends I can't find. She said, here's her phone number and her address. Give her a call. That night that I put a question mark by her name and prayed about it. Found her, went to my ex the next day, or called my ex the next day and said that she'd prayed about it and spoke to her sponsor and my sponsor that I could come over, went to her mom's the next day, and I walked in and you could feel it. You could feel it was thick. The blame, the shame, the guilt, the pain. And I started. This is why I'm here. So this is the format I was given once I go to somebody. I explain to them that I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is why I'm here. That's really great with exes, so they don't get any misunderstanding of why you're there, that you're not there to get back together. This is why I'm here. I explained that to her. She's in the program. She knew I was there. But I let her know that it was a lot more important to me than just not drinking again. That's pretty selfish. I told her that this relationship was still important to me. And I meant it. And I don't say that when I don't mean that. And then I go to the harm that I'm aware of. And then I ask the first question. Do you need to tell me anything else that I ever did that hurt you? It was 6.30. At 9.45, she took her next breath. She was done telling me the other things I had done that hurt her. And it was still thick. And then I asked the next question. All, when all the harm is out on the table, I ask, do you need to tell me how any of that hurt you? Because I might know exactly what I did, but I'm so insensitive I might not have any idea how that hurt you. I had some I thought were big deals. The guy didn't even remember me. I had some I thought were no big deal at all, and they said, you know, you really hurt me. So I ask. So I tell him why I'm there, the harm that I'm clear on. Is there any other harm I'm not aware of? How did that hurt you? Do you need to tell me? And this healing started to come in the room, and you could feel it, and it was shifting. And, when she, and it was 12 o'clock midnight when she got done telling me how it hurt her. And then I asked the magic question, is there anything I can do to, is there anything I could ever do to make this right? And she said, yeah, take me on your vacation next week to San Francisco and be in L.A. twice a month to go to therapy, and we'll see if we can work this out or at least end it in a healthy way. And all I could say was, I'll find a way to do that. And the next day, before we went on vacation as friends, an apartment was put in my lap for $450 a month on the beach in Santa Monica by someone that didn't even know why I was there. And the way to follow through on those amends was put right in my lap. 
So I don't know what they're going to ask. I don't know what kind of healing is going on. I have a sense that I'm going for them to get free as much as me to get free. And I watch amazing things happen. So don't go into men's thinking you know what they're going to ask. Oh, they're going to ask me to pay back the money. They might not. They might ask you to give it somewhere else. They might throw you out of their office. But it does say that nine times out of ten, you're going to be amazed. And very, I can't even remember the, if there had been any where I was rejected. I remember my brother wouldn't hear my amends three times I asked him. But the third time he heard me speak at a meeting in Battle Creek, and he said, I'm ready to hear your amends. You don't know how they're going to go. You don't know how they're going to get made. You're not, you're not going to know how they're going to be found. <clears throat> but it will remind you. It'll take you back to booze again. It'll remind you. Remember, you've agreed to go to any length for victory over alcohol. You don't sacrifice yourself. You might have to seek counsel. There might be crimes. Don't let your sponsor edit your amends list. Everyone they take off, they're just saying, they might as well give you a razor blade. Because they're saying, here's another piece of freedom you're not going to have. Here's another piece of freedom you're not going to have. I've heard sponsors in New York tell their, tell their uh, sponsees, don't go back to the women you were in relationships with. What's that about? My sponsor told me they're some of the most important amends in your life. I've heard people say you can't go back to drug dealers. How do you know that? I went back to the drug dealer I ripped off in Key West who was a major drug dealer, and I got down there to make amends to him, and I found him, and he was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous that wanted to hear about the work. My sponsor had a truck route when he got out of the Colorado State Penitentiary, and there was one amends that he had to drive by every single day, and every single day he drove by that house, he couldn't go in there. And one day he drove by the house, and it was like whatever resistance was was gone. He went up to that house, he knocked on the door, he spoke to this guy's mother and father, and they said, it couldn't be a more perfect day. Our son's in trouble. We need your help. And that was the right day. You don't know. You do not know. A friend of mine went to make amends to Woolworths. He found their main office in the city. He went to their office. He went to the accounting division. They couldn't see him. He's frustrated. He goes into the cafeteria to have a cup of coffee. He sees a guy sitting by himself working on some books, walks up to the guy. He said, I'm the head accountant. I'd love to hear your amends and finished his amends. And the guy said, I'm in, I have a drinking problem. Will you help me? You do not know the power that comes into your life when you're open up to make amends. Don't miss it. And don't let anybody tell you you can't finish every one of them. And by finish, I don't mean you followed through totally. When someone in our group says they've finished amends, it means they've made all their approaches, even the ones you can't find. The book says to write an honest letter, and you read it to somebody. And you hold yourself ready that if you were ever to see that person, you would make them. Because we have some that you might be, you might have some financial ones you're paying off for years, but you've made the approach, you've, you've made the best deal you can. The follow through is not finished, but the, the approach is, is finished. You might have some in your life you know will be ongoing the rest of your life to a mother, a father, an ex-wife, current wife. But you've made the approach. Now you follow through. But when you've made all the approaches that you possibly can and found all the ones you possibly can, your life's, you're not even going to be the same. I remember being in a meeting with my friend Mark Houston, and this old boy in Texas said, the idea that you can finish a man's is like thinking you could take a feather pillow to the top of the Empire State Building, let all them feathers go, and then go find every one of them. And Mark didn't even think. He said, what if you had a personal relationship with the creator of those feathers? Could he take you back to each one? Hmm. It's not me coming up with a plan. You hear this all the time, and I don't believe it. I'm working the steps to the best of my ability. And my friend says to me, I thought the best of your ability was to be glued to a bar stool down the street. What do you mean you're working the steps to the best of your ability? You work the steps based on the power you get from God to move on to the next step, the next amends, the next amends. Help me find this one. Do a search. I know people that have gotten private investigators to find amends. Remember, it was agreed. And my friend Mark always says, with the amends that you're questioning, how free do you want to be? How free do you want to be? 
I've heard Paul Martin, 60, almost 60 years sober, brought in by Dr. Bob, talk about realizing an amends he'd never thought of for 20 years or something for a pair of tennis shoes that he stole from a sporting goods store, and he doesn't think it has any connection to today. He goes and makes amends at that store when he's in that town for the shoes he stole, and some financial stuff in his life totally straightens out. Because you and I usually think that things aren't connected. You and I are the kind of people that think, what does writing inventory about 20 years ago have to do with how I'm feeling at work today? It does. It does. And my, my sponsor would say, I'd call him with all these problems at work, and he'd say, write inventory. And I'd say, what does writing inventory about 20 years ago have to do with being centered today? He says, it does. Everything's connected. You're wondering why you're having trouble with sex? Look at the unfinished amends in that area. You're wondering why you're having trouble with financial stuff this long sober? Look at some financial unfinished amends. It's all connected. It's all connected. And that's when the promise of the circle starts to come true. That's when the committee starts to get smashed. That's when the personalities begin to die. That's when you begin to become at one. That's the definition to atone. To amend is to atone. To atone is to become at one. This is when you start to enter the world of the spirit. And you're not dealing with different belief systems for every relationship. You're not different. You're not behaving different with every person in your life. It's just about equanimity. Find out about equanimity. What does that mean? I've had, I have and have had people in my life that don't te- they don't treat a leper any different than they would if the president was visiting them. You watch how they treat their sisters the same way they treat a beggar. You watch people that have that oneness. And once in a while, I've gotten to touch that. I've gotten to experience what do they mean when they say we've entered the world of the spirit. Because that's the next thing they're going to go into. They're going to go through different situations with sex, infidelity, debts, crimes. And you just make amends. You just make amends. You make, you make amends your, pra- your practice. Whatever you do, it does say to begin 10 and 11 as you clean up the past. 10 and 11 will, will help you to be centered, but you should focus everything you do with 10 and 11 on show me any amends I'm not aware of. Show me what my next amend should be and show me how to find the ones I'm looking for. Make that the focus of 10 and 11. Make that the focus of upon awakening. Make that the focus of your evening review. Make that the focus of your 10 step and try to stay current the best you can with step 10 throughout the day so you're not creating more amends than you're making. But I will tell you this. When you reach a day where from your head to your heart, you realize You've made amends to everyone you've ever heard that you're consciously aware of. There will be more in the future. There will be more that's revealed. But you're going to reach a place one day where all the approaches are done and 10 and 11 are going to take on another life. It's going to be like night and day. It's going to be like night and day when you, I've known guys that have gotten down to their last amends and I'm talking, when I say last amends, I mean you can only go with the ones you're aware of. You can't make amends to people you're not aware of. I heard a guy one time, he said, I never did volunteer work in a blackout. <laughs> and that he was praying to God to be shown amends that he, that he might have made while he was in blackouts. And he was asking God to show him. And he was being taken to some amazing places. One that came to mind just now that I was with a guy not too long ago, this was watching somebody make amends. I was uh, I was in New York, and we were going to a party in Brooklyn, and I was going to ride with this one guy, but this other guy, you're going to start hearing him. He's a, he's a new circuit speaker. Oh, I've been teasing him mercifully. His name's Peter, Peter M. from Brooklyn. And he said, will you ride with me because I'd like to go to the corner where I watched my mother killed. I've made amends to her at her grave, but I haven't gone back to this corner. And he tells me the story on our way to Brooklyn from Staten Island. And he says when he was seven years old, he lived upstairs in this brownstone apartment in Red Hook. And that he uh, was out on the corner with his little brother and he watched his mother beat to death on this corner. And he said, will you go there with me? I said, yeah. 
We went to this corner. I sat in the car. He got out. It was a scary neighborhood, but it was so scary there wasn't even anybody around. It wasn't scary because of the people. It was just scary. And he gets out of the car and he starts making amends and I can feel it's not happening. He gets back in the car. I said, you're not done, are you? He said, no. I said, go back. He went back outside the car. He gets in his knees on this corner in Red Hook in Brooklyn. And I could feel it in the car. And I could feel when it was done and I stepped out of the car and I looked on this red brick wall and somebody had drawn a little cute picture with white chalk, field and flowers. And I said, look at that, Peter. He said, wow, that's amazing. And then I looked down on the cement and I thought I saw his name written, Peter, but it was really Petro. And he looked down, he goes, man, if that would have been my name in the cement on this corner, it would have just blown my mind. I couldn't take it. We took three steps toward the car, and there's his name, his brother's name, heart, heart, mom. And it just blew his mind in the cement. And he had been there with the brother whose name was there in the cement, too. And you just get to watch amazing things when you because you're living from a different place. You're living from a fourth dimension. And when the big book says that we've uh, we've been rocketed into a fourth dimension, not only is it not outside of you, not only is it inside of you, but it just simply means you're not dominated by your body, your mind, or your emotions anymore. That's all I had my whole life until amends were done. I'm either dragged around by the cravings of my body, the obsessions in my mind, or my sickened emotions, or all three at the same time. We get to enter a place deep down within ourselves because now the stuff is blocking us from the world of the spirit, from the great reality, from whatever you want to call it that's deep down within. That stuff has, be, has been removed. And I've entered the world of my own spirit. It's not some esoteric, ooh, we've entered the world of the spirit. It just means you've touched a part of your being that you were never in touch with. Sometimes the right amount of alcohol and the right amount of drugs got me to that place. But it wasn't. It felt real. I got power from alcohol. It did for me what I couldn't do for its for for myself. But it quit working. If alcohol was still still taking me to that, you know, there, I think there's a phrase that Sigmund that Freud had or or Carl Jung, spiritus e spiritum. It's that means something about there's a fine line between spirits and spirit, or that spirits can bring you to spirit. Hmm. There's only one letter difference, you know. But now I've entered the world of the spirit rather than living in the world of spirits. <coughs> Alcohol, right? Then 10 and 11 and 12 will take on a whole new life. A lot of people think step 10 is about writing inventory and making amends. But we've already seen how much more to each step there is beyond the short form. We've seen how much more to step one there is than to just uh, admit you're powerless and that your life is unmanageable. That fully conceding to your innermost self is much different than saying that you're powerless in your life. We've seen there's much more to step two than just coming to believe. Much more to three, much more to four. But people will sell st step ten short and think, because what he wrote in the 12 and 12 is so confusing. But what he wrote here is so clear. And they're not maintenance steps. And anybody that tells you that 10, 11, and 12 is just repeating 1 through 9, they're selling it short. And they're not, why, why do I say they're not maintenance steps? Because my book says that our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Who wants to stay in the place they're in at the end of step 9? Nor could you if you wanted to. Because of the resurgence of ego and because of the power of God. This is something that should continue for a lifetime. There's infinity in step 10, 11, and 12. Not maintaining something that you already got. It's about growing and understanding and effectiveness. This is how I see step 10 today. Step 11 gives you something to do in the morning and something to do at night and a couple things to do throughout the day, like pause when agitated or doubtful. I see the 10th step as this. The tenth step is a moving meditation that you are in from the time you get up from your morning meditation until you sit down in your evening meditation. It's putting one foot in front of the other. It's continuing to watch. But keep in mind the, the key word there is continue. It doesn't say wait till you get home. 
It doesn't say uh, you got to write another inventory. It doesn't say you got to go through all this stuff to get back to some amends if you've caused harm today. It says as you go out in the day and you put one foot in front of the other, continue to watch for these things and that they will crop up. Keep in mind, here's one that I got stuck on. Step 10 starts in the middle of page 84. It says that we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any, any mistakes. But here's the key. As we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. You can do whatever you can with 10 and 11 and 12 as you're making amends, but it won't be the same as when you're done with amends. Everything will blow wide open. You finish amends until your next time through the work, except the daily things that are revealed to you. It's time to start having some fun. It's time to go out there and experiment. Have some fun. We've entered the world of the Spirit. Our next function is to grow Not stay where we are, not maintain. Grow in understanding and effectiveness. You see, you gotta have both. This is one of those like knowledge of God's will and the power to carry it out. One without the other is futile. You could have all the knowledge in the world of God's will but no power to carry it out. Just like this. Understanding without effectiveness is worthless. And effectiveness without understanding is empty. This is not an overnight matter. You see how many times they say continue in this one paragraph? Because that's what it commenced as we go along. We've entered the world. Our next function. This is a moving, active meditation that takes place between your morning and your evening. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. It doesn't say if they crop up. It says they're going (laughs) to. When they crop up, We ask God at once to remove them. I thought it said, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God to remove them at once. No. You're not telling God when to remove it. It's telling you when to ask Him. You see the difference between asking God to remove them? I'm sorry. We ask God at once to remove them, then we ask God to remove them at once. It's two different things. You don't tell him when to remove them, but it tells you when to ask him to at once. Discuss it with someone. Now, do I always have to do that? How do I know when I need to do all three of those things? Absolutely not. You're sitting at your desk. You get distracted by some resentment from the guy next to you. If you can, if you can ask God to remove it and turn your thoughts back to where you were, you don't need to take Rob from your boss and call somebody to take 20 minutes. The barometer as to how many of these things you have to do is in your ability to turn back to where you work, who you can help. And you know what you, who you can help when you're sitting at your desk working for your boss? You can help your boss by turning back to your work. Do I always have to do all four of these things? No. Sometimes I ask God, Sometimes I ask God at once to remove it, see if I've caused any harm, and turn my thoughts back to someone I can help. Sometimes you'll have to do all four. Sometimes it'll still be there at night. Sometimes you're going to have to clean it up the next day. It'll become a corrective measure. But what my friends have been talking to me about lately is preemptive ten-step work. What do they mean by that? If we start to see by continuing work with step 10 how we can decide out of these feelings, how we can turn out of resentment, how we can turn away from fear, what to do when these things crop up, and we see that we have the power to decide out of them, don't you think we made some decisions to decide into them? So I've been asking myself lately, show me the decisions I make which lead to my fears cropping up. Show me the decisions I make that lead to my resentments cropping up so I can do the work at the front end in the morning. So I don't have to wait for it to crop up where I might have been asleep and caused harm and have to go make amends. And it's very simple. You're now going to start to learn to work with power. They're going to talk to you about proper use of the will. Now there's some promises. How many of us have been to meetings on these promises? 
Have you really ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol? You're going to catch yourself when you fight. It's going to show up in your evening review or your next inventory. Has sanity returned? Imagine that at a topic at the next meeting you go to. <laughs> you'll seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, your recoils from a hot flame. You'll react sanely and normally, and you'll find this has happened automatically. You will see that your new attitude toward liquor has been given you without any thought or effort on your part. What do you mean, any thought or effort? I've put all this effort into it. No, you haven't. Not on your attitude toward liquor. We haven't talked about liquor since the first step. It just comes. It comes from looking at self, and defects, harm, and making amends. How many meetings have we been to where this is, this is discussed? We're not fighting it, neither are we avoiding it. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. The problem has been removed. In that state, there's no more choice to drink than there was to not drink. That's the state I was describing to you. And if in this state, you couldn't drink even if you wanted to. The choice is removed on the other end rather than you had to drink. There's no more choice in a fit spiritual condition there than there was to not drink in an unfit spiritual condition. This is our experience. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. But I've also hit bottom with that. I can't keep myself in fit spiritual condition. I can't self-will that or I'd be doing a lot better. That's another gift. It takes effort. It's easy to let up on the program of action. And you've got by now a lot of laurels to rest on. The laurels are all those amends you've made. You're headed for trouble if you rest on whatever power you've been given. For alcohol is a subtle foe. You're not cured of alcoholism, but you can live in a recovered state. Cured and recovered are two different things. What we really have is a daily reprieve, contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when you must carry the vision of God's will into all your activities. How can you best serve God? Thy will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. Why isn't this ever a topic at meetings? We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish it is the proper use of the will. And I've been to lots of meetings on this part of the 10th step when you're in a group where they finish amends. Because when you're finished amends and you're in a fit spiritual condition, then your willpower is aligned with God's. You're not given your will back. You're given a new will. You gave your will up in 4 through 9. You take the third step, your life is no longer any of your business. But now it says you're going to have a willpower that you can begin to use. What is the line of the will? The line of the will is when you're living in front of the will rather than being dragged around by it. Where you're deciding. Where you set your intent. Where you decide what you want to do. Where you make your plans for the day. You're living in front of the will rather than behind it. What is the proper use of the will? Find out. Have fun. It says you're going to make mistakes. It says the idea that you're going to be inspired at all times is ridiculous and you're going to pay for that presumption with all sorts of incredible ideas and actions. Then the 11th step will give you what to do in the morning and at night. It tells you exactly what to do in the evening review, but make sure it's constructive. Make sure it's fun. If your evening review isn't fun, you won't do it because now you're free. Make your evening practice something you enjoy. Answer these questions. I write down any corrective measures for tomorrow. And it becomes part of my plans for tomorrow. Now, why does it say upon awakening? It's funny that they always say the third thing. For, they, should, they always say the first thing third. On awakening, think about the 24 hours ahead. Consider your plans for the day. And now the third sentence says, but before you begin, ask God to direct your thinking. Asking especially that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonors, or self-seeking motives. That's like after the third step prayer, they say, we thought well before we took it. <laughs> so they're asking you to ask God to direct your thinking first. And then a man asked me once, do you think they're repeating themselves when they ask you to think about the 24 hours ahead and consider your plans for the day? Because if I'm thinking about the 24 hours ahead, aren't I considering my plans? He said, no, they're two different things. In thinking about the 24 hours ahead, think about what you would like to be. And in considering your plans for the day, think about what you need to do. 
They're two different things. Being and doing. Being, what you would like to be today, you'll get a great guide from your evening review from last night. Yesterday I was intolerant. I was short. I wasn't clear at the business meeting. See, what you're working here now is not with different personalities. You're working with attitude. Proper attitude. Proper use. What should be an attitude for a business meeting is not the same attitude for a fun time dinner with friends. Fun time dinner with friends, you don't go with the same attitude that you would into an executive meeting or an AA meeting. You're working with attitudes. So I look at my evening review from last night and I saw I was short with her. I wasn't clear at the business meeting. So today what I would like to be is, and what I need to do is... And if I have any corrective measures from the paragraph above from the evening review, I write them in my plans for tomorrow at night. See, because to consider your plans for the day, you've got to have some. <laughs> and know that that can change and you've got power in your life now where plans can change and you can be flexible. And you're going to begin to use your intuition. i got two things that have come up at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Which one am I supposed to do? Doubt, indecision, it tells me exactly what to do. Ask for the right thought or action when I'm agitated or doubtful. So it gives me something to do at night. It gives me something to do in the morning. It tells me what to do if I'm facing indecision. It tells me when I'm asking for an answer to relax and take it easy. That's not my nature. My nature when I'm confused or I have indecision is to go into my head and figure it out. Do you know that this book promises you a sixth sense? How many meetings have you been at where they talk about promises where they brought up that one? And that's a pretty big one, wouldn't you think? That the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, is, uh, <laughs> the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous promises you another sense besides the five you're used to? A new sixth sense. That's a big deal. You ever been involved in a process that gave you another sense beyond sight, touch, feel, or smell, or taste? This one promises you a new sense. What is that sense? It's intuition. You know, I can honestly say to you that some of the time, more and more all the time, I trust intuition more than logic and reason. And I was a guy that depended on my own mind my whole life. It's all I thought I had. I never thought there was anything beyond mind. There is so much beyond mind. And that's what I said I was going to talk about in a minute, a few minutes ago, in this. One through nine has been the most revolutionary process I've ever been exposed to. And I continue to do one through nine. But I'll tell you this, discipline, meditation, and a commitment to it, and fidelity to meditation, has changed my life as much as one through nine ever did. It's like another world beyond the world you're taken to from finishing amends. Just To just decide. Let's say you decide for one year, I'm going to do a practice that I choose, along with Upon Awakening, and along with the evening review, and I'm going to do it every morning, and I'm going to do it every night, and I'm going to stick to this practice, and I'm going to see where it takes me. And you start to experience where a uh, commitment to meditation will take you. And then you become interested in prayer. And then you start to find out about prayer, the power of prayer, mantra, repetitive prayer. I used to hear these Tibetan prayers. I had absolutely no idea what they meant. The first assignment my teacher that I have now gave me was to say some mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. Now who in the world is going to go home and say that? I don't even know the words. I don't even know what it means. And then I asked some idiot. Of course, I didn't ask my teacher what it means. I'm not going to tell him I don't know what it means. But I'm going to go home and say that some words I don't even know 30,000 times before I come back to see him? No. So I asked some idiot, what does the prayer mean? He said, jewel in the lotus. And I thought to myself, why in the world would anybody want to sit there repeating jewel in the lotus, jewel in the lotus? And I got so frustrated, I had to tell my teacher. And he said, who told you that that's what it means? I said, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What does it mean? He said, if anybody understands the word Om, it's the universal sound of meditation, which means I bow to the sound of the silence in the diamond of the lotus of my heart. And then I understood a prayer that I could get to. 
It's so non-denominational. That I can sit and do, because that's what I want. I want to be able to honor the sound of the silence that's deep in the center of the lotus of the diamond in my heart. That I can understand. And then I, I just thought people were sitting in a room repeating sounds. The power of prayer, the power of meditation, the power of mantra. And then you'll become interested in how this power connects to this power and that there's no separation between them and how to bring that out into the world. And that's all that step 12 is about. But please don't expect a spiritual awakening as a result of sitting in meetings and not drinking. It says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we had the power to carry this message and we had the power to practice these principles. Always remember, the steps are the principles. And from those steps there will come principles other than just the spiritual exercises in the 12 steps. Don't sell the 12 steps short. They're not meeting some other principles when they say and practice these principles. They've just given you the principles. It's a hard enough practice. Just trying to practice 10 and 11 on a daily basis is not easy. It takes work. It takes practice. <coughs> But a lot more than me, people will guarantee you that you'll have an amazing life. How does a guy like me go from where I was to actually caring about other people? How does a guy like me go from where I was to falling in love with working with others? And taking people through the work and watching them catch on fire. It's going to become not only the bright spot, it's going to become the brightness of your life. Thanks so much for letting me come. <clears throat>